and welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 132. I've got a funny feeling I said it was 132 last week. It was 131 last week. Definitely 132 this week. So today we're going to be talking about a photo shoot or headshots that I did for a couple of musicians called the Galloway Players. Um, and basically I did two different setups with them where the lighting and the background were different. Even though the poses were more or less the same, the mood and feel was dramatically different. So I thought that would be kind of interesting to discuss. Also, we've got a couple of people sent in for critique, so we'll be looking at those images afterwards. And don't, uh, do make sure you stay around as well, because I'm going to be telling you uh, what's coming up just before Christmas and also into the new year. And I've got a couple of plans for next year, so stick around. Um, if you're here, leave me a comment. Say hello if you're watching live on YouTube. Um, say where you're from, tell me what the weather's like where you are, get the chat going. Uh, let's enjoy this afternoon's um, podcast. Uh, no, not what I was going to do. That's what I was going to do. So yes, welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> chat i can see there's some chat here already so let's just we've got a few people in let's let's see what's happening oh so pat is here saying uh wet and cold and dreary down here in somerset brighten my day please um rosemary says good morning from a chilly western washington state i can tell by the beautiful light on the home screen photo for today's episode that is going to be a great one well i hope you're not disappointed uh, roy says dry warm and sunny here in west yorkshire pat hope that helps <laughs> um maggie says cold cold Cold, cold here today. It is in fact sunny out the window, um, although I've had to close the blinds and stick the artificial light on because it will be dark before I get to the end of this podcast and I don't want to be leaping up out um, to do that. So it could be several weeks before actually I can um, just be working by natural daylight again. Three o'clock here in Scotland, but that does mean the sun will be down in about half an hour-ish. Uh, Meg says, good afternoon, everybody. April says, hi, all. It's only a cold, a cool day here on Long Island, New York. Can't believe it's December. No, absolutely December already. Who'd have thought? Um, so I, saw, I saw a thing on Facebook the other day which said, oh, no, December. I'm going to have to change my regular anxiety for Christmas anxiety. I'm sure that rings true for a few people. Nadia says, hi, everyone. Pat says, no, Roy, it doesn't. Oh, well, that's with reference to the fact that it's cold and uh, it's clear in Yorkshire. Um, Andy says, hey, everyone. Glad you could make it along, Andy. Roy says, just kidding. It's freezing and wet. Oh, right. <laughs> it's freezing and wet, says Roy. Uh, Jack says, hello, everyone. And Jeff joins us uh, from a rubbish day here in North Wales. So, oh, it's generally a bit wet and cold. Certainly, it is sunny here at the moment, but cold and a damp feel in the air still. Right, okay, so welcome everybody. Glad we've got people in. So hopefully then are you, are you should be interested in today. So like I say, what, I, the, what I'm going to talk about now today is um, headshots, a couple of headshots I did uh, for two musicians, the Galloway players. So um, Ian plays the guitar, Rebecca plays the flute. Uh, they got together about a year ago um, and discovered that they're, that when they play, that there's a real um, connection between them. They're not a couple, they're both, you know, uh, as as in, you know, going out with each other or married or anything like that. Um, but as musicians, they there's there's there, there is this incredible connection. And um, they started telling me when I first met up with them, and they said, you know, they said they wanted, would there be a way of trying to capture that? And so. We talked through that. And then when I actually went out to do the photo, the, the headshots with them, um, they they played they played me a set for about sort of 10, 15 minutes before we started. And it was quite electrifying. There really is just sort of watching the two of them play together. And they play a sort of mix of classical and traditional music with but the way they they move and play off each other. I mean, sometimes you can watch musicians and they're in the same room and they're playing the right notes and they're all in time and all in the right key and all in tune. But essentially, everybody's kind of working individually. And sometimes you come across musicians who just connect to each other and you could feel that movement 
and that connection between them. And there's the whole body language, there's the way that as one, you're not just playing alone, you're tuned in totally to what the other person is doing and then reacting and informing and then they're reacting and informing too. Um, as a kind of, well, I'm not a musician at anywhere like their level, but because I play with other people, sometimes I know what that can feel like, but it's pretty rare. So it was really interesting to meet them. Um, so we started off, basically at this point, I'm going to be doing a couple of other photo shoots with them, which are going to be more dramatic narrative photo shoots. Now, we haven't had the chance to do those yet, but part of the package as such was the idea that what we also wanted to do was get just get them some basic headshots. And I think what I'll do here is I'll show you, I'll start off with the photo that they currently have on their website. So they shove their website together, they take in a quick photo um, where they'd put a phone up in, uh, I think I said it, up in the tree, pointed it at them, and um, where are we? Uh, need to, sorry. <laughs> Still getting the hang of which buttons to press, even after two and a half years, nearly three years of this. So this was, so we got uh, Rebecca and Ian there, and this was the, this is the photo, if you go to their website, that's the one they've currently got on. Well, I've, I have now given them the new web, the new images, but it's, it's not up yet. So the thought was then, well, okay, you know, we've got a starting point, but what we're wanting now is, is for all the fact that, okay, you can see two people here and you can see they've got instruments. It does, it does very much have the feel of quick photo taken on the phone. We're wanting to have something kind of much more professional. And when we started talking about the ideas of what we wanted, the, the initial idea was we would go white background. The great thing about white background type shots is you can kind of extend them out left and right. They're neutral in the background. And so for publicity photos, for if you're wanting to have a picture with a bit of writing on the side, you can extend it out to the right or up above and just keep it white. And it, there's nothing too complicated about it. So we set up and let me show you then though I did. I'll show you. The, so this then was the photo that I did of Ian. And what I've got here, we've got a white background. In fact, actually, basically, he had a white wall. It was a stone wall. Um, and what I did was I put a flash, um, which, as you're looking at this, would be behind him and to the right. And I had it pointing at the wall. So bright flash going up against the wall. It's whitening out the wall, but it's also creating a little bit of kind of backlight, edge light on his head. And then to the left over my shoulder, as, as you're looking at this, as I'm taking it, I've got my large softbox. And um, in fact, actually, if we kind of zoom in, you can just about make out the sort of reflection in the eye there to see the softbox. I think I might have had the grid on it uh, as well. I think there's a sort of slight grid line in there. And and then there's and then it's about a case of once I've got the lighting set up, it's a case of getting the right mood and feel. And we talked about that notion of owning the space that too often when we're doing portraits, we put whoever's in front of the camera just feels intensely self-conscious. So a large part of what I do as a portrait photographer is work people through their anxiety and fear of being in front of the camera. It always helps with musicians. I will say I've got a start. You've got a starting point with musicians because most musicians um, are also performers. They're used to being up on stage. They're used to playing in front of people and they know that it's not just about playing notes. It's about creating a performance. So there is a certain amount of acting, if you like, or creating a presence, um, a, projecting a sort of certain amount of personality. And so a lot of the talking behind this was about tapping into the skills that they've already got, perhaps didn't realize was tra were transferable in front of the camera. And then getting, so here we have this, so we've got this great picture then of um, uh, of Ian um, and he nailed it. You know, he's, he's just got this really strong, vibrant presence to him. Uh, we then went on, I did a photo of Rebecca, again, managing to get that, that notion of her owning the space. There's nothing aggressive, but there's a confidence, there's a, a, a relaxed confidence that says, I am here, is unapologetic, but there's a, a little bit of warmth in the smile and the eyes. And so when you get that, you go, you've got the, it's a, like I say, clear white background, heightened in um, 
Photoshop afterwards just sort of whitened up any little kind of grey areas just to make it completely white. But then we want to have the two of them together. And so the one of the tricks with when you're if you're shooting two people is I quite like to do heads touching. And the reason for this is gaps get exaggerated in photography. Now I've talked about this before, but it, it's always worth talking about, which is the notion that if I've got something by the side of my head, like, you know, this, this glasses case or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, now, for me, this feels really quite close to my head. This is almost sort of phone distance. Um, but if you were standing actually in the room with me, from your point of view, which is somewhere off there to somewhere way over there, this only takes up about 5% of your image. But because you're now looking at it through a camera and we've got like an edge here and an edge there, this is now taking up about 10% or 15% of the gap. When people are standing side by side, they're quite often about this far apart. And that is taking up about 30 to 40% of the, of the image. So a gap becomes exaggerated. The gap to the eye when you're standing in the room with somebody might only be 5% of the gap. But with the edge, within the edges of the photo, it's 40%. And that's why your wedding photographers are always going closer, closer, because the gaps get exaggerated. So there's no, in real life, these two wouldn't be like this. They wouldn't be that close, but it looks natural in the photo. So you remove the gaps. But what also happens actually is when you put two people this close, and essentially then there's a there's a kind of a there's a sort of body reaction which says okay I'm with somebody else we're in a space and you relax slight in a slightly different way and you start to see the connection um, they're both looking at the camera but they both it feels like that you the two of them are a unit which is the way they work when they're playing and so Overall, we felt we were kind of really quite pleased with the way we got there. So then what we want to do, we wanted to do the same thing, but actually have, um, but to, to have, then have the instruments in as well. We played around, sorry, um, yeah, flip back here. So I've been talking. Uh, so yeah, here's the, I'm hoping, I'm, yeah, the, the two of them together and then with the instruments. Um, and... We played around with different kind of angles with the instruments, um, whether they should be straight up or whatever. But in the end, I mean, as many of you know who watch regularly, diagonals. I always tend to talk about the fact that diagonals are where there's an energy, a sense of movement, even in even if it's static. And they're here. They're not moving. They're not going anywhere. But because we've got this kind of lovely V shape, it's acting as a kind of frame around them. So what I was talking about, boundaries, kind of creating boundaries that sort of pull your eye back into it. And at the same time, so it's sort of framing them, it's creating a boundary, it's drawing your eye back in, but also those diagonals lend a level, a certain level of energy into the picture. So bright white background, like I say, light hitting the wall, whiting it out, and then we've got the big soft box coming down and you can see the highlights in the eyes, um, the catch lights in the eyes. Um, telling you that we've got the nice soft box, which is giving that lovely kind of very gentle soft shadow uh, into it. So quite a kind of high key photo. So that's where we started. Um, and uh, so then what we did, so we, that was actually all we were going to do. But then I just decided to try something whereby I turned the flash off on the background, which made the, the, the the, the wall kind of a dark gray. And I just used single light. And what happened then is by having a single light, it ends up being a very kind of paint, had a painterly quality. So showed them in the back of the camera and they thought, oh, that looks really interesting. Um, and they kind of got caught up in it. So I thought, well, okay, we can do something else here. And so we moved away from the white wall and decided that just using the light and dialing down the exposure meant that the background got very dark and was almost black. So we could, um, we could create, a, I could just play with the idea of a single light and try something completely different in terms of the light and the feel. Uh, I can see I've got, I've got a couple of uh, comments in. Oh, Stacy's joined us, says, good morning, a little late due to being tired after work on Saturday. Um, 
Chilly this morning, but but sunny. Well, glad you could make it, Stacey. And Fiji says, good evening, everyone. Um, great focus. Yeah, I must admit, actually, we'll just say the, the focus, the, there's something I love about the new camera. My Canon um, R5 has a wonderful kind of uh, face recognition and eye recognition bit. I So um, I managed to program it. So one of the back buttons, I when I'm um, focusing, I can click on that and it it recognizes where the eye is on for doing portraits, latches onto the eye, so the eye is always in focus. So, um, which is really, really important in portrait photography that the eye that's closest to the camera is pin sharp. Um, and the problem is, is you can line it up and just in the fraction of a second that you take between getting it in focus and going click, you can sometimes move forward or back a little bit. They can move forward or back a little bit. And suddenly the nose is nice and sharp, but the eye isn't quite there. Or the ear is nice and sharp, but the eye isn't quite there. So there's sometimes a little bit of movement, depending on how wide your aperture is um, and how much depth of fo focus you've got to play with. Uh, so, um, but this, this little sort of fancy bit of the new camera I absolutely love because it doesn't matter if you're walking backwards or forwards very slightly it might be imperceptible to you but the camera still latches onto the eye and it means the hit rate is much much higher pretty much every photo I took the eyes were in focus which really helps and then that frees me up to not be worrying about that the whether the eyes in focus but to make sure that the expression and the body language and the lighting and everything else is right uh, and Rosemary says, uh, the tip about heads together is very helpful. Thanks. Yes, there's definitely a useful one to know. OK, so what I want to do now is I'm going to show you the the the, the next bit of the um, which is where what we decided to do was go dark. And so if. So this was the one with the white background. And so then what we did was we went dark background. And as you can see, the mood changes dramatically. Um, Ian's posture is maybe I've turned him a little bit more. His the expression is slightly different, but there's there's not a lot of difference really, except for the fact that the mood changes dramatically. This now becomes much more painterly. Um, and again, we've talked before about the notion with lighting that. When you've just got a single light and a soft light, again, you've got the soft box coming down, um, it tends to create a more painterly kind of thing because the you kind of your Dutch old masters painters didn't have electricity to paint by. So they were usually painting either by candlelight or by window light, and generally speaking, a single window. So my my large soft box tends to emulate the, the light of a la, of a of a window. And so you just get that that light coming down again. You've got the catch light. You can just see the catch light in the eyes here um, where the, the soft box is going. And it gives this lovely lost shadow, uh, soft shadow. But then it drops off into the background. Um, and there's something else I did here that the background itself was the rest of the room. Um, and whilst it was mostly dark, the, the, I could still make out with some pieces. And in the editing, I sort of blackened it down and then I added a little bit of texture and I'm hoping you can see this in there here. But if I just kind of move in here, you can see a little bit of kind of added texture into the background. Um, you know, go over his shoulder here on the right. And that again, it's, it, it helped break up the notion of just the kind of an absolute black uh, blackness. Um, but actually, the texture also tends to end up adding slightly to that painterly feel. There's, a, there's almost a sense of brush stroke with it. Um, so this then was the one that I did at Ian and then uh, did one with the, holding the guitar this time. We didn't do that with the white background, but we decided while well, we've now got the black background, let's get so, so uh, Ian alone with the guitar, again, strong diagonal with it. Um, and then here's our one of uh, Rebecca. And again, to if I show you uh, Here's again, you've got the white background with Rebecca. OK, this one's pulled out slightly more. We can see the expression isn't a million miles away, but a totally and utterly different feel and mood from this. Um, again, much more painterly. But that but it, the, and this is really what I want. The, the point of showing you these photos is to show you the comparison, is to understand that. Even though the poses 
and the expressions are more or less the same, whether you've got, you know, in both sets of photos, the feel, the mood is so different. They're light years apart. Um, and the, the difference is having a white background and a second light and a black background and a single light. And that black background, oh, sorry, and that single light is still the same in both of them. It's the same soft box with a grid, I think, um, creating that sort of beautiful, soft, creamy shadow. But having, so the only difference is then actually having a black background or having a white background with a light shining on it. Um, and then the, this one, Rebecca with, with her flute, and again, making sure we get the diagonal into it. And then finally, the two of them together with their instruments. So again, if I go to here and let's just do this one, so you can kind of get a direct comparison. You know, subtle difference in the shape of the head, but you know, tilted forward or back a little bit, but not a huge amount. I mean, in essence, same expressions, same angle, same pose, totally different feel. Uh, now, do, you might have a preference for one or the other. You might prefer this one to this one, or you might prefer it the other way around. Um, the point is with, with the, they have, because they have different moods, they have different um, options of things you can do with them. And depending on the concert you're doing, depending on the promoter, um, depending on the... Um, you know, the, 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 what you're needing to project, the, the press release, what are you trying to project for that particular concert or for this particular article that's being written about you or anything like that? Sometimes you want to have the white background and sometimes you want to have the dark background and because they are going to give you a totally different feel. Um, and then just to do one last little thing to show you, I then did all these in black and white as well. So, and the black and white changes it again so the difference say between you know the color and the black and white changes the mood you've got you've got a, a, a different kind of vibe going on so these are black and white ones we've got Rebecca we've got the two of them with the instruments and then again black and white with the with the dark background as well these all change and have an entirely different feel to them as well. So understanding then your choice between whether you're going to use colour or black and white, whether you're going to use light background or dark background, whether you're going to use one light source or two light sources, all these things can have a profound effect on the way your photos turn out. And this is entirely separate from expression and pose, because what I've shown you here is that the expression and pose is the same in the white background as it is in the black background and I'd absolutely identical in terms of the black and white or the color because all I've done is turned it to black and white. Um, so I hope you found that useful. I hope you found that interesting. A um, couple of uh, comments. Uh, oh, Andy says nearly perfect Rembrandt, Rembrandt lighting and uh, Rosemary says the painterly light and texture background are really beautiful. Pat says the photos are beautiful. They look like soulmates. It would be great to hear their music also. Really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. have to hear them at some point. But I think they've got an EP coming out soon. Um, I might have in the, in fact, I sh I'm fairly certain in the description of this video of, of this podcast i've actually got a link to their site the galloway players um, dot com i think it is so you can after after this go and take a look at that site make a note of it bookmark it somewhere so you can be ready or get on their newsletter if you want to know when their ep comes out um, maggie says such beautiful lighting and he says the intimacy of the dark lighting is probably more in keeping with the intimacy of their performance. It can be that way. That's true. Uh, Rosemary says so fascinating how the impact of the color, um, the color of the background has well uh, and the number of lights. And April says, I love the black and white with the instruments in hand as well. Excellent. Cool. Great. Well, glad you found that interesting. Uh, so, yeah, like I say, I would definitely recommend um, Go and check out the Galloway players. Uh, it's like there, there is a link in the description um, 
of this or you know on the on the on YouTube. And in fact, actually, they I can't remember whether they've got a YouTube channel or not. Worth checking out. Right. So um, let's move on then. And what uh, what we're going to do now is the critique section. So I have um, both VG and Roy have sent in images for critique. Like I said, what I would like to do, uh, do stick around towards the end as well, because I'm going to tell you what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Because I'm going to have a challenge for you. Oh, no, 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 it's not really a challenge. I'm going to have a bit of, I'll tell you, okay, uh, I'll talk again about it at the end, but, but in two weeks time is the Sunday before Christmas. We're going to have a bit of festive fun. Um, and so a chance to send in photos of, you know, festive related uh, for the season. So anyway, I will chat more about that and ideas about what we're doing there because I'm not going to, there won't be a podcast on Christmas Day nor on New Year's Day. So in two weeks time, that will be the last one of the year and then it will be three weeks after that, the 8th of January, when we'll start up the podcast again. And I've got a whole bunch of new ideas for next year. But I'll talk about that at the end of uh, end of this podcast. Right, so, yes, um, critique. <laughs> so, critique section. Yes, yeah, so this is your chance to send in your images and get feedback. Uh, and this really is, I think, the... Um, there's so few places on the internet where we can get genuine feedback. There are some places which are quite hostile. Um, years ago, there was a place which I used to go to to get uh, critique on my images. And there were some people on there who were quite snarky and not particularly nice and just made you feel a bit useless for having done whatever it was that they didn't like. Uh, they might well have been right, but their manner was terrible. They seemed to quite enjoy um feeling superior that they knew and you didn't. And I always, that was horrific and I always hated that. So part of my reason for setting up the critique section on here was to give people a safe place to learn, um, to get feedback about it. photography. It doesn't matter what level you're at. You could be right back, you know, at beginner level, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't, however advanced you get with your photos, critique is always useful. Um, we all have blind spots to our own images. So, to be able to get feedback from somebody you trust is a really useful thing to be able to do. So do keep sending images in. So this week, what we have is uh, we've got VG and we've got Roy. So I'll start with VG. And um, so VG sent a couple of photos. Um, and where are we? So if I flip over here. So VG took a photo from her terrace. I tried taking uh, night shots from my terrace last night with a slow shutter speed to get the lights to sparkle. Now, just a, a wee thing with this. So what you can see here is you can see, you know, we've got these fantastic kind of light beams coming out wherever there's a sort of strong uh, light. It, you, know, you get these, these sort of streaks coming out. Now, what actually makes those happen isn't so much the slow shutter speed as the narrow aperture. Now, if you're going to go for a narrow aperture, then you're going to have to compensate by having a slow shutter speed. So that's what causes it. But basically, if you get your, sh if you narrow your aperture to f11, f13, f16, f22, the more narrow you can get your, your f-stop, the more you will get that flare effect. So it's the opposite of bokeh. If you think about um, where you're looking for that, that sort of soft, those really sort of rounded kind of blurs in the background. Lights go rounded and blurred when you've got a very wide aperture. When, but the narrower the aperture comes, you kind of invert. You go from rounded to getting the kind of light sparkling at, sparking out the side. Um, now, I don't have... Uh, uh, VG was going to be sending me the high resolution images. Something seems to have messed up somewhere in the in the um, in the sending, and I didn't manage to get them. So I've only got the um, sort of Facebook images here. However, should be enough to. Um, so this was the photo she took, but I don't know what the exact settings were for this. Um, anyway, she then um, edited. She sent the edited uh, version, and where are we? The edited one is this. So she darkened it down and said, I had to, um, I would like to know how to edit, how the editing could have been done better. I had to darken the background several shades to bring out the bright, sharp lights, but somehow it looks artificial. 
So basically what's happened then is this has been the kind of, you know, the, 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 the first, the, 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 the main shot as such, the unedited version. And then, but she's wanted to kind of make a bit more oomph with the kind of contrast of light and dark. And it's gone to this, but we've now, whilst these lights, it, 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 does, it does feel kind of like it's gone too far. So what else could we have done with that? So what we'll do is, um, let's open this in Photoshop. And in essence, the, the part of the problem here is that in order to try and make the light stand out, you've made you've darkened everything else. But what what ended up happening was everything else got just a bit too dark. So when we look at this, we kind of lost. We've got lights, and that's fine. But we've almost lost the context. We can no longer really. Oh, sorry, come back to that one. Yeah, not that one. Not that one. Come back to these. Um, this is doing weird things. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. But when we kind of zoom in, we've lost the edge of the building. We can't actually see the outline anymore. So what's happened is it's mostly dots. There's a tiny little bit of blue here where you have the sky and it fades a little bit, but I think we've kind of lost a bit too much. So if we go back to here where we can still make out some of the stuff, but maybe it's just feeling a little bit flat. So the first thought with something like this is to go to the brightness and contrast. And if I go to this and I grab the contrast and pull it over, what actually happens is we end up with more or less what you ended up with. So it's become very contrasty. We've lost the outline of the buildings. The, you know, maybe we try brightening it up a bit. Possibly it's kind of getting there, but it's, it's a it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. Um, I, th I think once you've got such a strong contrast, you you maybe want to play with the brightness a bit, and that kind of gives a little bit more. Unfortunately, because this is um, a web version of the photo, it's very low resolution, so I am not totally sure how much detail you can actually pull out of the shadows. If if I'd got the original raw file, um, I'd I'd have a better idea. However. Um, Another option here, if I hit Control J and just duplicate that layer, if I go to Camera Raw and open it in this. So let me just make that a little bit bigger to give you a sense of what's going on. So the contrast is where you've done that, but that itself isn't working. The other tool to play around with here is Clarity, because Clarity is kind of like the contrast, but it's much more detailed. And when we do this, you can see it's it's still creating a contrast between dark and light, but it's allowing more of the because there's quite a lot of interest going on down here. I think, you know, there's shops open, there's lights on, um, there's bits of building which I think have got quite nice shape to them. And then we've got these lights in here as well. And I think really that so that become now the thing is with the, the, the clarity, I will say part of the, it, it doesn't it does tend to sap the color a little bit. So you might want to just boost the vibrance a little bit just to bring a little bit more color back into the sky like that. Now, one of the problems we do have with this, having done this, is it's become very noisy and we've got a banding problem here, which is where the, the computer is trying to interpret gradation. And it can only go so far. And the lower resolution you've got, the, the harder it is, or the less of the 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 less of the tonal range between light and dark, a mid-range to a dark, and you start adjusting it and you end up with this problem of it kind of interprets bands, which never looks quite so good. Now, if you've, depending on your original high resolution one VG, you might be able to get away with that a little bit more. But I would say really, when it comes to the editing, it's it's really about, yeah, try try playing around with your clarity tool, the texture tool, is more subtle again, but probably a little bit too subtle. I would say the clarity is probably the place to go. Um, now, again, depending on what you've got, you might want to play with the noise reduction because the more you play around with the clarity tool, the noisier the picture tends to get. So you can soften some of that noise by using the noise reduction. Um, maybe the color noise as well. Not sure how much that difference would make. I did need to play around. Um, 
other than that, I think it's quite fun. I think there's a nice shape. I like the, the crop that you've got, the fact that you've got the reflections in the water here. Um, so you can see that everything's kind of stood out a little bit more. You could possibly play around if we, you get something like the, the dodge and burn and you get the dodge tool um, and use the mid-tones. I've got this mid-tone set at 6% and just start lightly rubbing over the top and you can see that it just starts bringing out a little bit more in the reflections in the water which I think work quite well. So you can just see from it's subtle and you, you want to keep it kind of low. Again there is a problem that the more you play with this the noisier things get but there might be one or two other places where you think actually maybe I want a little bit more of that building coming up there or a little bit here. Um, and if there's bits which you feel you really want shoved, made darker, then you can use the opposite and use the burn tool and put burn into the shadows. And maybe you didn't want this building here and you can start kind of darkening that down so it disappears, leaving nothing but the light that was there. Um, so you see, I, so a, a notion of using dodge and burn and maybe the clarity tool like I say, you might have to play around with a bit of noise reduction. I think these are the areas, these are the tools that you really need, VG. So, hope that was useful. Uh, right, uh, Andy says, maybe shoot in HDR or bracket for this type of image. Um, so, Yes, I mean that. That's uh, that's certainly in in the taking of the photo. There are quite often options you can you can use with your camera. So, bracketing or, or HDR options are where essentially what you do with each photo, you can take three photos or five photos, depending on how complex you want to get. But what you do is you take your kind of mid range photo. You take a photo of what you think are your best settings. And then you take an underexposed photo where the lights, the, the lighter parts are going to work better. And then you take an overexposed photo, sorry, and that, yeah, um, where you're underexposed, overexposed, sorry, just, anyway, one of them you're going to get more detail out of the shadows. Yes, and the overexposed one. You then get more detail out of the shadows, but the highlights tend to blow out. An underexposed photo you'll get more detail in the highlights but you'll lose every you'll lose everything in the shadows but by get by, by getting three you can then combine them and generally speaking photoshop and quite a few other i think a lot of um imaging image editing software will do this for you you can then combine the three photos together and it will work out what should be dark what should be light and you get the best of all worlds but that means you but you have to do that at the point you're taking the photo so Check the menu settings on your photo before and in your camera. Maybe go check that out on YouTube or something like that. Look up for, the, for your make of camera, look up HDR photo or bracketing. And you'll, there's probably a menu setting where you can just go and click on something. And when you take a photo, it will take three photos. Some, some of them will do it automatically. It'll take three photos and merge them together. If you like to edit them yourself on Photoshop, Make sure you keep the original photo separate and then you can play around with how much of each photo you want to merge together. So, yeah, good suggestion there, Andy. Um, what have we got? Oh, Vigi says, sorry, Kim, my mistake. I sent the mail for my phone. It got delayed and you would have got it, but too late. Yeah, tricky thing where you're very often when you're taking photos from your, if you're forwarding something from your phone um, on a mail, a lot of phones default to sending a web sized image. So it won't send the, the full high resolution image um, unless you specifically override the defaults. So, uh, yeah, some, uh, something to know for the future. But anyway, as long as you've got the general gist of what I meant, then that's that's OK, VG. Uh, so April says, good night shot. Meg says, I really like the lights in the building with the dark effect of the whole photo. Fantastic. Uh, VG says, beautiful edit. Thank you so much. Dodging is a brilliant idea. I used raw filter and did clarity texture, etc. But dodging I didn't use. OK, well, glad that the idea of dodge works then. Uh, Stacey says, I, try, I like trying to take night photographs hard, but I use a tripod and open the aperture a bit. Lots of experimentation. Yeah, I, you, you do. You have to play um, 
open the aperture wider, you get more light in, but of course you then maybe don't end up with as much depth of, of field either, so not everything's going to be in focus. Um, and that's where Andy's suggestion of bracketing or, for, um, or HDR is probably uh, an interesting way to go for that. So thanks very much for that, Fiji, and uh, thanks Andy for that suggestion too. And so what we'll move on to now is Roy, uh, and then I'll tell you all what's uh, coming up in the next few weeks. So Roy sent in this photo and he said, um, hi Kim, this is from a series I'm doing at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And that's true, I remember you sent a couple of other things in from the uh, Yorkshire Sculpture Park before. It looks like an amazing place and I will definitely have to go there sometime. My aim is to show the sculptures as part of the landscape they inhabit. I'm sort of happy, happy with it, but feel it needs a bit of oomph. What do you suggest, please? Okay, so what we've got here then is Roy, the, we've, there's, uh, in the sculpture park, we've got this giant head, so it reminds me a little bit of that bit at the end of Planet of the Apes, where, <laughs> where Charlton Heston is going along the beach and suddenly he notices the, the, the top half of the um, Statue of Liberty sticking out the sand. The, this sort of remain here, just this, this head that looks like it should have been on some massive statue, but you've only got the head left. Is the rest of it buried under the ground, like the Statue of Liberty in... Uh, in Planet of the Apes or like the Easter Island heads or is it just a head that's been sort of that's fallen off and been taken and placed somewhere um, so fun fun sculpture and what you've done here is you've sort of framed it between we've got steps going down to it these this this stone wall uh, sandstone wall kind of or, or gate almost gate post at the top of the steps and you've used those to frame the idea of leading our um, eyes towards uh, the head because obviously the head is what it's about but it's not just what the head the head is the head as you said you want the head in the environment we're not we're not just looking at the statue of the head itself we also want to see that it is in the sculpture park it is in these grounds uh, which looks like a kind of country estate kind of kind of grounds um, so fun photo you've obviously thought about it you've got that kind of lining up of, of getting up so where where might we improve this or where might problems lie so a couple of things that struck me upon looking at the photo the first is we do have a slightly kind of blown sky here um the the sky when we come up here we've got very very white patches of sky um we've sort of lost detail in the cloud and because that's very white and there's a lot of it it does tend to draw the attention one of the things I've talked about before, and I, there's, but I've not done it for a while, so let me just um, let's just open this with Photoshop because uh, I want to show you the trick again. Let's close that one from VG. When we're looking at a photo, now you know you took you we're taking a photo of the head, so the head is what you see, and then everything else is in relation to the head because that's what you've done. But if you're not the person who took the photo. Is that necessarily what immediately catches the eye? And the way to do this, the way to check this, is to blur the photo. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that and I'm going to blur it, but I'm going to blur it beyond recognition. So we're going to take this up and take this up until we get to a point whereby you can't tell what it is. Do we need to go to that? We'll, we'll, we'll just go to there. Okay. And then as an extra bit here, what I'm going to do, I'm going to invert it. So I'm going to um, rotate that 180 degrees. So now you don't know what it is you're looking at. And when you look at this photo, you then have to say, what grabs your attention? Okay. So let me just get a little pencil here. And what actually grabs your attention is this big bright patch. You've got a big bright patch of whitey blue. Or we've got a powerful patch of green here, powerful patch of green here. So these bits here are the bit that are grabbing your attention. They're the bright patches. They're the bright patches surrounded by slightly darker patches. So we tend to ignore that bit and we tend to ignore that bit because it's and we pretty much tend to ignore that bit because they're dark, they're not really what's grabbing our attention. What's grabbing our attention is a bright green patch, a bright green patch, and a bright kind of pale blue patch. 
So what's grabbing the attention here, Roy, is precisely not <laughs> what you want people to be focusing on. You're wanting your point of this is that it's about the head. You're wanting people to notice that. And the background is supposed to be a supporting player. They're the, you know, the, the best supporting actor. They're the um, two, the, the, the main uh, the main course. I'm mixing up my metaphors here. This is the important bit. This bit is just in support of it. So what can we do about that? Now, first thing I do have to say as well is I, I, it feels tilted to me. It might not be tilted. It might be that in genuinely the, the grass all, everything slopes down slightly to the left. Uh, but I do, I do have to say for me on the crop tool, I just have to kind of tilt that slightly I have to line that up a little bit more um, but I breathe a bit easier my little bit of OCD and straight horizons and and or straight verticals are, now it's never going to be totally straight because you've the, the slight wide angle lens and we notice the 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 po the stone wall here goes slightly off to the right here and slightly off to the left there that's okay but what but by balancing it slightly this now feels a little bit more so that works better. We've got a really bright sky here. Can we just brighten the sky down? Well, that might work. Sometimes what you do is you you bright you you darken down the bits that you're that aren't so. Um, so we do that. But then maybe what we need to do is I'll just is we need to brighten this back up um, to make sure our attention is drawn back to this. So. And that maybe helps a little bit, but it's not brilliant, to be honest. It does look very heavily vignetted. Uh, this sky is still grabbing a whole load of attention. So to be honest, I think what I would be more prepared to do, let's just duplicate this layer, is to crop in. I don't know that you need the sky. Now, what you, you said, you're trying to get a notion of the environment it's in. The important bit of this environment is the notion that it's in a kind of country garden house type thing, the sculpture park. So you don't need all of it. And I would be tempted to crop out a lot of the sky. You don't want to crop all of it out because you are still trying to keep part of it. But if we do something like this kind of rule of thirds ish, something like this, maybe. Um, and you, got, you only need enough sky to know that the sky is there. Maybe just have that little bit of tree kind of popping out maybe have a little bit of gap above the tree you don't want anything more than that um i think we we there's a bit of stone staircase just to know that there's enough to know that you're leading down there we don't need any more than that stone pathway stone walls we've got one in we don't necessarily need the other and i think if you have something like this now we're starting to get more of a sense of we've still got the head, we've still got the environment, but the environment isn't now overpowering the head in the same way. And then if what we were to do is go in and do some of the use some of the, um, the usual tricks of, say, add a little bit of vignette to just kind of although this side kind of with the tree and the wall acts as a kind of a natural vignette on this side, maybe a little bit of vignette on the left just to pull it in a fraction over here and darken down this corner. And again, maybe uh, bring that up a little, maybe, maybe bring the shadows up a little bit. Yeah, that's really not the, not the exposure. It's the shadows because this is quite dark. Um, so if you bring the shadows up, I think, and then again, clarity tool, give it a little bit of punch, something like that. Um, perhaps go back, drop that vignette in a little bit something like there we go more or less um, so we've gone from that to that and hopefully you can now see that that kind of draws a little bit more attention to the head and again if we wanted to just to kind of lighten that head up a little bit more using the dodge and burn we just kind of come in using the, the dodge I've got again mid-tone six percent and just a couple of times lightly rub over the top of that and you can see that makes that stand out a little bit more. Um, so if we then, uh, let's just bunch those together. So you can see we've gone from that to that. Let's just pull back in here so you can kind of get a better sense of uh, the photo as we've cropped it. 
and I think it draws your attention in. Now, actually, maybe I've created a bit too much in the background here, and that was slightly better, softer. Um, in which case, what I might do is, again, place a mask there, and we'll, we'll maybe drop that down to 40% or something, and I'll just mask out part of what I've done with the clarity in the background. Because whilst I think it works well here, I think it's maybe just created a bit too much detail into the into the background and I just sort of soften some of those highlights there so that they're not grabbing the attention away. So I think yeah I think that now works a bit better. So hopefully then the Roy that kind of gives you a better sense of what's going on that um, in your original photo whilst you were wanting to have context you were wanting the environment was important the environment ended up overpowering what you were trying to show there is something else here i would say i'm not totally sure how well you've done it but there's some really weird bits of pixeling going on here which looks like you've been editing out something the, these bits here just don't look quite natural. this sort of suddenly comes up and goes and there's a bit of funny shadow here and there's a bit of funny blob here this looks like you've been using the healing tool and that's fine, I use the healing tool all the time, except for the fact that you've got to be careful how you use the healing tool so that it, you can't see the edits. So you do need to tidy up whatever it was you were editing out there. I'm guessing there was something in here that was playing in the way of your photo, whether it was a dog going for a walk or it's another sculpture or it was somebody standing there having a cigarette, I don't know. You've obviously removed them, except for the fact that there's, uh, we can still see that you removed them. So you need to kind of tidy that up a bit. Um, However, beyond that, I think hopefully then, Roy, that gives you a better idea that with something like this, we're making the head proportionally bigger, you know, so that it's, it's now occupying a larger area of the picture. So that draws attention to it, but it's not, be, we've lightened it a bit, but it's also not being overwhelmed by the setting. There's enough setting in there for us to feel, yes, that works. Yes, we know, understand the setting that it's in. It's still interesting, but it hasn't overwhelmed the uh, the main focus of the picture. So I hope that helps. I hope that gives you um, some thoughts and ideas there. Uh, right, what else have we got? Yeah, so Pat says, uh, great head, Roy. I'm fond of my head hygia. Hygia, hygia, which I bought from Greece. Meg says, great photo, Roy. Stacy says, maybe change the saturation on the grass so it isn't a focal point. That's another idea. You can tone down the grass. You could only do it subtly, though. Otherwise, the grass is going to end up a little bit grey. Um, uh, Stacy also says she likes the sculpture. Rosemary says, I'm glad you shared this, Roy. I've never seen a blue head on a lawn before. <laughs> and Roy says, thanks for the help. Uh, the advice helpful as always. Excellent. And April says, creative photo, Roy. Cool, great, excellent. Well, thank you very much, Roy, for sending that one in. So now, what I'm going to talk about then, uh, quick notions of next week, the week after, and when we come back in the new year. So next week, I'm going to be talking a little bit. I did a, I did some photos earlier in the year of a bit of, um, it's kind of street theatre, uh, performance collector Strand Ra did a thing called Bippity, where we had five players, and there was a real improvisational aspect to it. It was quite fun doing the photos, completely different to the stuff that I usually do. They were, um, it wasn't a setup, there was no control over the lighting. It was more like street photography, as in you're kind of shooting, you're reacting to what's around you. But at the same time, whilst I had no input over the positions or the what the, the the street theatre players were going to do, um, there are certain key things that you can start looking out for. So I thought I'll chat about that and, and take you through that. There will also be a critique section next week. So I'll have room for three or four critiques. So if you have any photos you really like some feedback on, um, bearing in mind that it could be several weeks or certainly into next year before I, we get another proper critique section, then uh, make sure you send the images. You can either go to the Facebook page and there is, go to Facebook, type in Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers, where you will find the fa Facebook page and put it in there. Or uh, email me if you don't do Facebook, uh, kimayers.co.uk. So that's just straightforwardly kim at kimayers.co.uk. And tell me a little bit about the photo, what it is you, um, uh, your struggling point is, what a bit of background 
uh, of it and um, I will do my best to help you with that. Uh, now in two weeks time then, two weeks on the, well it's the fourth today so that'll be the 18th. The 18th then is the last Sunday before Christmas so we're going to have festive fun. I'm not going to call it a challenge, it's not a challenge, it's a festive fun. Now festive obviously Christmas being the big one but if you want to do Hanukkah that's fine. If there's uh, a midwinter solstice festival that's okay. If it's somebody's birthday in December that's fine. If there's another um, Hindu festival happening in December, uh, VG, you know, go for that. Doesn't really matter. The idea of it being a kind of bit of festive fun. And for this, you can do, there's there's whole all sorts of um, options and uh, to play around with. I mean, there's, you can do people, obviously. Now you were people dressed up in, you know, um, snowmen sweater, snowman sweaters, or uh, at a barbecue, if you happen to be in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, or opening presents or reacting to things. But you can also do still life, um, you arrange things, or you can do food. I mean, there's so much festive food about, whether it's from mince pies and um, chocolate eggs. Oh, no, that's, that's more Easter. Cho Terry's chocolate orange eggs. <laughs> not, not eggs, oranges. Chocolate orange, that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, very very Christmassy in the UK. Um, or you could, uh, you could do kind of Christmas baubles. Go macro, get in really close. Um, so there's all sorts of go go for textures and wrapping papers create little sculptures i seem to remember a year or two ago uh vg created a lovely little christmas tree out of some uh uh magazine pa uh, uh, pages pages that's the word <laughs> play getting close with the tinsel um there's there's all sorts of things so a bit yeah stick a santa hat on your cat stick a bit of tinsel around the uh, around the fish tank fun let's have some festive fun send me your photos in for within two weeks time for the friday before no later than and so that week before christmas we'll just share some festive fun photos um so that's that's your challenge for two weeks time and then when we come back uh on the like i say there won't be one on christmas day there won't be one on new year's day so the next one after that will be the 8th of january I'm going to do a best of 2022, something we've done for the last couple of years, the best of the previous year. So at that point, we will. I want you to send me your favourite image of 2022 and tell me a little bit about it. So it might be because it's the one that won awards or scored highly in a competition or just one that is really meaningful to you. So send me the image, send me the story behind it and we'll start off the new year with celebrating the best of the photography that we've taken, our favourite photos from the previous year. And then after that, I've got ideas of what I want to do for maybe going into 2023, where I'm thinking that maybe at the moment, up until now, we've got we've had 132 of these podcasts, and so far they've been relatively random. From week to week, I talk about whatever photo shoot or a particular camera technique or editing technique or compositional lighting technique and I thought well okay what about these sort of these things they, why don't we just kind of actually create a bit more be a bit more systematic about it so I'm going to start off and I'm going to run through over the next sort of six to eight months however long it takes I'm going to run through a whole bunch of specific things to understand about photography so we'll start off with that you'll, you know, over the first month or so, we will look at shutter speed, what you can do with slow shutter speed, what you can do with fast shutter speed. Then we'll move on to things like um, aperture, what you can do with wide apertures, what you can do with narrow apertures. We'll then move on to things like ISO, what, what it is and how you can use it to your advantage. Um, and then we'll maybe move on to things like different compositional techniques, whether we're talking about rule of thirds or use of diagonals or leading lines and what have you. And then we'll, we'll also talk about different lighting, side light, backlight, coloured light, um, and maybe some editing techniques, understanding a little bit about masking, about cropping, um, all these kind of things. So what I really want to do is I'm going to kind of create a system that kind of takes us through over several months really the kind of a, a to z of what you need to know of, or what you would be you would find interesting in photography and when we get to the end of that well maybe i'll repeat but <laughs> the the thing is is that 
this is your chance to really kind of get going. I will be asking you to start maybe having a go at some of the things that I'm talking about as well. But all this to come later, but that's just a little taster. Meanwhile, next week, if you've got images you want to send in for critique, get them into me in the next couple of days. And then in two weeks time, festive fun. Those are the main things that you need to remember. Um, OK, a couple of last comments here. Um, VG saying looking forward to the challenge. Uh, Robert says, how are you all from Texas? Sorry, we're late. We'll catch up later. Uh, would love to hear more about editing techniques. Rosemary says, sounds like a great plan. Looking forward to it. And April says, sounds good, everyone. Right. So that's us. Um, thank you ever so much to everybody who's turned up and um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> to all of you for commenting, to VG Roy for sending in images, and I look for, oh, and yeah, one last thing, if you find these both podcasts useful, interesting, um, or entertaining, then and you would like to support them, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is definitely one of the ways you can do it, and I look forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye.